In this video, I'm going to explain Grasshopper data trees. This is not a beginner tutorial. It assumes you already have some understanding of basic Grasshopper concepts. There's content in here that will be useful to new learners of Grasshopper and some ideas that may even surprise experts. I want to share with you my very opinionated mental model of data trees. Not all Grasshopper users would agree with me about the best practices I recommend here, but I've been building up these ideas over more than a decade of personal and professional Grasshopper use, and I personally think they're a good way to think about how trees work. Some of the terms I'll use are official Grasshopper terminology, and some are just things I made up. So without further ado, what's the deal with data trees? What are they? Data trees are how Grasshopper handles lists of lists. They're a record of the provenance of every single item. They're a vocabulary of operations you can use to transform the structure of the data, and a set of consistent rules for how components lace or match the data across multiple inputs to a component. So I'll explain each of these in turn. So in Grasshopper, data can be passed around from component to component in one of three forms, as a single item, a list, or a list of lists called a data tree. In a list, items have their own addresses called indices, which count from zero. So the fourth item in the list is at index three. In a data tree, each list, called a branch of the tree, has its own more complex address called a branch path. One important thing to know is that data trees happen on their own. Grasshopper will automatically construct data trees for you. In fact, all data, even single items and lists, are just special cases of data trees. As I said at the beginning, they're a record of the provenance of every single item. To understand why this happens, you have to look closely at components. I'm going to introduce a made-up vocabulary for the kinds of components you encounter in Grasshopper so we can understand how they work with data trees. A component that takes in single items and produces single items, like extrude, is a one-to-one -one component. These components will not alter your data trees. The structure going in is the same as the structure coming out. If you feed this component a list, a list will come out the other side. The index of each output item will match the index of the input it came from. A component like divide curve is what I call a one-to-many component. For every item you supply it, it will or can generate multiple items on the output. In order to keep your resulting data organized, these components append a new index to your branch path. This is useful when you supply a list of inputs. It keeps the resulting data organized by where it came from. So the index on the input gets appended to the branch path of the output. So if you look at the branch path, you can figure out which input item generated it. So this two at the end of the red branch path on the right comes from the index of the item from which it was generated, this sort of swoopy curve. A component like polyline is a many to one component. If you feed it a list, it will generate a single item on the output. It does not transform your branch paths. In the olden days of Grasshopper, before there were data trees, if you wanted to construct multiple polylines, you had to make multiple copies of the polyline component. And I still see beginner Grasshopper users making big copy-paste stacks of sets of components. With good mastery of data trees, you almost never need to do this. Instead, just structure your input into branches, and the component will treat each branch separately. So on the left, we've got three branches of five points each, and we pass these into polyline, and we now get three polylines out the other side. How do you know what kind of component you're dealing with? You hover over the inputs and outputs. If it doesn't say list or tree, you're dealing with item access. So this is an example of item access on the left and item access on the right. We call that a one-to-one. -one. If you see as list on the left and 
no list on the right. You're dealing with a many to one component. And if you see list on the right, you're dealing with a one to many component. So a component like divide takes in a single item and generates a list of data on the output. Part of the reason why all this is important is because of what I call the hierarchy of geometry. In general, mastery of grasshopper is all about learning a new way of thinking about modeling. In this way of thinking, you're always building up complex forms from simple ones or deconstructing complex systems in order to operate on them in a more simple form. As you go down the hierarchy, you're often getting multiple items for every input item. So these are often one to many components. As you move back up, you are composing single items from multiple items. So you're usually dealing with many to one components. Let's walk through an example where we work our way down the hierarchy through a series of one to many components. So I've got a list with two B reps. What happens when I want to get the faces from those B reps using deconstruct B rep, which is a one to many component? It's going to organize the results by two new branches to tell me where each B rep face came from. The faces in branch 01 came from the B rep at index 1 in the original list. What if we want to get all the edges of each face with B rep edges, another component? It's going to create new branches, one for each face, with a list of edges in each one. The edges at branch 0, 1, 3 came from the face at index 3 on the B rep at index 1 in the original list. So this is what this looks like in Grasshopper. I've got my list of two B reps with a branch path of just 0. I feed those into the deconstruct B rep component in order to get the faces back out. And because this is a one-to-many component, it generates two branches, one branch for each item I originally supplied it. And then I get a list of all of the faces belonging to each of my original B reps. In turn, when I want to get the edges from each one of those faces, I feed it into B rep edges. And again, because this is one to many, it generates a new branch for every item that was input. And it does this by appending a new number to the end of the branch path, which corresponds to the index that uh, was present in the previous list. So I know that a branch 001 is the second item in the previous list from the first item in the list even before that. So I also mentioned that data trees have a vocabulary of operations that you can use to transform the structure of the data. Let's take a look at a few of these. The most important operation is graft. Graft does the same thing that a one-to-many component does automatically. It puts every item on its own list. Every item is moved onto its own list, and what was previously its item index gets appended to the branch path. Now each item is at index 0 in its own new list. The opposite of a graft is called shift paths or trim tree. There are two components in Grasshopper that perform basically the same operation. This operation takes a tree and chops off the last index of each branch path. Items that were previously on separate branches are grouped back together based on their new truncated branch paths. So items in branches that started with 0, 01, like 0, 01, 0, 0, 01, 01, are now all back together in branch 0, 01. The last operation is also the most destructive. If you want to discard your tree information entirely and condense the whole tree into a single list, you can flatten it. This is equivalent to doing trim tree for as many levels as are in your branches. So if you just trim tree all the way to the end, it's the equivalent of flattening. In order to really work with data trees, you need a mental model of how items from different inputs are matched to each other. So data trees consists of a set of rules for how components will match between multiple inputs to a component. 
So if you have a component that does a thing with some data going into input A and other data going into input B, how do you know which pieces from A and which pieces from B it will do that thing to? We're going to talk about this in the context of components with item access, but it will help you build a general intuition. So let's take a concatenate component, which just joins two things together. We're gonna to give it a list of length n, in this case, n equals three, but I'm using n generically to refer to the length of a list that has more than one item. So we give it a list of length n into the first input and a list with a single item into the second input. It will match that item to every item in the list like so. So it's grabbed the items at index zero in the first list and matched them up to the single item in the second list and then the next one to the single item in the second list, and then the next one, and so on. If you have a list with n items in A and a list with n items in B, it's just going to go down the list, matching them item by item, uh, and joining them on their index. So the items at index 0 will be processed together and joined, the items at index one will be processed together and joined, and the items at index two will be processed together and joined. So all of this is pretty simple and intuitive. And the good news is, if you understand this, you already understand branch matching behavior. And the reason for this is because branches get matched exactly the same way as items. It just happens twice. So when you're dealing with a complex set of data trees and you're feeding one data tree into A and another data tree into B, it basically goes through this process two times. First, it matches the branches into pairs, and then it matches the items in each pair of branches. So let's walk through this example in a little more detail. So in this scenario, we have two branches in A and one branch in B. The branches in A have three items, and the branches in B also have three items. First, we match the branches. And since there are two branches in A but one in B, it reuses the single B branch across all the A branches. Then, it matches the items in each branch pair. This uses the same logic as the examples we saw earlier, matching each item by index. In this scenario, we have two branches in both A and B, but the branches in B only have one item apiece. First, we match the branches, and then we match the items in each branch pair. In this scenario, we have m equals two branches in A and two branches in B, and each branch has n equals three items. First, we match the branches, and then we match the items in each branch pair. So, I'm going to wrap up by providing some rules and best practices for what I call healthy and happy data trees. And what do I mean by that? I mean trees that work in a predictable way, that allow your scripts to be robust to inputs that change, and that you can use inside clusters all over and over again without worrying about the structures inside breaking. So this is a really common use scenario where you want to build a script that you can use over and over and over again. You want to save it as a user object. Um, but you find that the next time you go to use it, because the data trees aren't the same, it breaks. So I'm going to show you some rules of thumb that will prevent that from happening. So the first rule is all paired branches should have either n items or one item. Don't miss, mix lists of different lengths. So when you're matching items, you want to make sure every list being matched has either n items or one item. And it doesn't matter how long n is, I'm just using n as a placeholder for any number. You almost never want the case where the two lists have different lengths. There are exceptions with some components, but this is a good rule of thumb to follow, especially until you really know what you're doing. 
And so this plus that I'm indicating here in the diagram, these are two lists going into the input of a component. So it's just like our previous example with concatenate. You can imagine the left-hand side of the plus being list A and the right-hand side of the plus being list B. Similar to the previous rule, we have the same idea for branches. All inputs should have either M branches or one branch. Don't mix inputs with different branch counts. So if I've got 20 branches, I can easily match those up with a structure that has one branch. If I have 20 branches in A, I can easily match that up to a structure that has 20 branches in B. But it's probably not what I meant to do to match up uh, 20 branches in A with five branches in B. If you need to get these two branches to talk to each other or to mirror each other in structure, you actually need to manipulate your data itself, making the first one match with the second one. And there are ways to do this with shifting paths or building up a data structure with graft and longest list or propagate ancestors from Dave Stasek's tree sloth plugin. There are lots of ways to approach this. I'm not gonna go into detail here. Hopefully in a part two of this video, I can share some of my practical strategies for getting your trees to line up. Another rule is that you should look before you merge. Don't allow jagged data trees to occur. And what do I mean by jagged? Jagged is where the branches in the tree have different numbers of indices. So over here on the right, I've got a branch that that's, has a branch path of zero and another branch in it that has a branch path of zero, zero. It has two indices where the upper one has one. Um, there's basically no reason you ever want a tree that looks like this. It will give you nothing but trouble later on. It makes doing all kinds of data operations really difficult. And so usually when people wind up with a scenario like this, they just flatten and they discard all of the useful information that's embedded in those trees. And I'm here to tell you that you should just never merge branches of, of a different branch path length in the first place. You should avoid flatten. Uh, in most cases. Uh, it prevents your definition from handling multiple items in the input. So these two routines look identical in the current situation where I've got one surface on the left-hand side. I'm feeding in one surface and I get one polyline out the other side. And both versions of this operation seem to do that just fine, no problem. One of them is using flatten and one of them is using trim tree or shift paths in order to relatively flatten the data that's going into it. And the reason why this is important is because flatten is a destructive operation. And when I feed it multiple surfaces, it's gonna give me back a single polyline instead of what I wanted, which is one polyline per input surface. So trim tree will allow you to be flexible to not knowing about the structure of the data that's coming in. It's a relative operation. It just shifts you one level instead of shifting all the levels at once. I also recommend avoiding simplify. People are always shocked to hear me say this because it seems like such a simple, helpful tool. It makes things simpler, right? But let me explain. Here's a scenario where we've got a jagged tree scenario coming out of our merge, like I warned about earlier. This loft doesn't work because the curves going into D1 and the curves going into D2 aren't merging into the same branches like we wanted them to. So a common solution to this is to simplify both of the inputs to the merge, which certainly works in this case. It trims away all the zeros from the branches so that our two trees merge the way we predicted. We've got the items from D1 and the items from D2 sort of weaving together into three branches. So what's the problem with this? Uh, there are two big reasons. One is if we try to shift paths after this, it doesn't work because our trees no longer have that trunk of the leading zero. But much more importantly, if our input data changes, say to have one item instead of multiple, simplify breaks down. It fails to simplify. You can see that because I've only got one item coming in on the dynamic pipeline in the upper left, now my merge has no longer merged these two things that are meant to be lofted together into the same list. It just leaves the tree structure as it is because Simplify doesn't know what to do with a list with only one item. So now our script is broken. So instead of simplifying, what I recommend is to simply get rid of the relative difference between the two structures ahead of time by shifting the tree. 
This operation will now always work regardless of the count and structure of the inputs upstream. So I say shift pads early and shift pads often. A general way to sum up these last couple of rules is this. Design your scripts as though the upstream trees are going to change shape, because in my experience, they nearly always will. And by change shape, I mean the numbers of items will change, the structure of the branches will change. Inevitably, when you go to update your definition or insert new logic somewhere in, you will find that the data trees have changed. And as long as you've followed the rules that I outlined, your definition will be able to accommodate those changes. Thanks so much for watching. Like, subscribe, and comment below. And if there's interest, I'll produce a part two of this video where I show some of these principles in practice.